Hello, uh, so I'm Thomas. I'm from UC Irvine, which is in Southern California. Uh, I'm giving this talk today about Forza 4. Who's played Forza 4? Or Forza 5 or 3 or any game in the Forza franchise? Okay. Uh, anybody play GTA? Yeah, somewhat similar number. Okay. Uh, so I'm giving this talk about some work I did at Microsoft Research. So that's me, top left, uh, before I went to uh, my hairdresser, who's Chinese and didn't understand what I wanted, so it's a bit too short. Uh, and I did this work with Tom in the middle and Nachi from Microsoft Research. That was an internship I did in 2013. And uh, bottom left is my advisor, Krista Lopes, uh, who lets me be here today. And this is work I did in collaboration with Turn 10, a studio in Redmond in Washington State. Uh, in particular, Ryan, Kevin, Dan, and Tyson. Um, yeah. Oh, and I'm graduating next year. So if you guys are looking for somebody to hire in UX, uh, <laughs> talk to me. Uh, oh yeah, so what I do is I do quantitative uh, analysis studies, so big data analytics. I look at basically giant gigabyte sized data sets or terabytes even, and I mine stuff, which is what I'm going to talk today about. So I look at telemetry data. So just so I know the audience also, who does qualitative research here? Okay, quantitative research, both. Everybody does both. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, this is going to be sort of lightweight on the quantitative side. Uh, it's not very deep, like crazy stats. It's mostly graphs that actually tell a story, hopefully. Uh, so the data I had was 5% uh, of the whole player base of Forza, uh, which we pulled from Turn 10 to Microsoft Research. Uh, why 5%? Because it's big enough that you don't have to worry about statistical significance. It was completely randomly selected, so there's no issue of bias. And it was, you know, uh, still representative. And it was actually tractable, because if you have the whole player base, it's something like five terabytes, and we couldn't pull that from turn 10. Uh, still, this uh, 200,000 people, uh, after cleanup, uh, generated 24 million races, uh, which is what we're going to look at. And uh, that was since from launch until July 2013. So by July 2013, when I did the internship, uh, players were already kind of done with the game. You had very few people who were picking up the game again. And so you had kind of a lifetime, uh, you know, start of the game uh, during release up to uh, late stage of the game, right? Basically, I think three months later, Forza 5 launched. So that's the idea. So in this talk, uh, what I'm going to talk about, and hopefully you'll uh, take away, is tricks to get acquainted with the data. So that's very very useful, I think, if you have, say, an intern like me, or a future intern, or somebody who, who you're onboarding into a project uh, to get acquainted with the data. So that's the couple of tricks I learned from Microsoft. Uh, and then the drill down, basically. So if you have an answer to uh, a question to answer, so your designers show up and say, hey, I'd like to know more about uh, uh, That's, I think, one way I'd recommend of going at it. OK. So, hello data. Uh, basically, this is the section about the quick and dirty mining tricks that I learned. Um, so if you want to do some quick and dirty segmentation or profiling of your players, uh, you have to look at a particular metric and just focus on that metric. So how do I know that this metric, the number of races, is one metric that's very good to look at? It's because I played the game. So if you play GTA, you know that there's no, no such thing as a race, right? You just walk around and you drive around and maybe you could say, oh, time spent on a mission, number of missions played, this kind of metric. In Forza, it's a racing game. So if you've played the game, you know that it's about the number of races played. Um, Vera this morning talked about uh, metrics in PVZ this morning. And so I can't emphasize enough that metrics is really golden. Uh, what else do I have to say? Yes. So the first tip we did was just a simple query uh, in SQL. OK, let's look at the average number of races that people play uh, over their lifetime. And so the average number was 120, which is ridiculously high, because 120 is the number of races you need to uh, complete to finish single player mode. We thought there's, there's something going on here. So if we look at the whole player spectrum, we really don't know what 120 races stand for. You can't really segment in, in any way with this. The average doesn't mean anything. So we looked at the median, and the median was 30. And that's very easy stuff. That's like half a day worth of work. And you're already like, hmm, something's going on here. I have 30, which is my median, and 120, which can be anywhere. So there's obviously some big outliers somewhere that are skewing the data 
towards like say you know a thousand races and a lot of people who have zero races. Uh, so knowing that your median is here lets you position your average way towards the end. Okay. Um, and then we looked at the top five percentile. So we thought, okay, the five percent of players who raced most, how much did they race? And they raced four hundred times. And they account for of the twenty-four million races we had, they make twelve million of the races, so half of them. So you have already kind of a quick and dirty way of segmenting your players based on the number of races. You have a segment here of kind of your you know one, two, up to thirty races played. So kind of your casual people, they try it and then they drop it. Uh, then you have the forty-five percent from thirty to four hundred. They're kind of your mid-core, you could say. Uh, although it's a it's just a shortcut you could label them with. And then you have your hardcore people who play 400 and more races. All right, so that's quick and dirty segmentation. That was a day worth of work. Um, this is a graph that's based on achievements in Xbox, uh, which uh, Bruce Phillips from Microsoft uh, Xbox came up with five years ago. But it's a really, really useful graph, I find. So the way to read it, on the x-axis, you have the number of months that the average player takes to unlock an achievement. So for instance, driver level one, which you get by completing races, you get XP, and XP gives you levels, right? Uh, driver level one, 80% of people obtain it, and they obtain it on average after five days. OK? I guess OK. And if you add all the other driver levels, you get a curve like this. And of course, you connect them because they're related. And you see that, oh, OK. If I look at, say, one month in, I have half of my player base that has trained already. If I look two months in, I have 25, well, 30% of my player base that's still playing. If I look four months in, I have roughly 15% of my player base remaining. So that gives you, just by looking at achievements and grouping by achievements, uh, you can see that your player base is churning in that kind of pattern. Yes? Since they started playing. Since they started playing. Yeah. OK. And then what this graph is also interesting, uh, what's also interesting in this graph is the top left part here, which is very cool for uh, free-to-play games and, well, any games in, particular, in general. That's the funnel, the beginner's funnel. So you can see that you have 2% of people or 3% who churn uh, before this achievement. Then you have probably an extra 10% who churn between these two achievements. So this was completing the first race. Then this was uh, buying your first car, then driver level one. So you can say, hmm, what happened between completing my first race and buying my first car? A lot of people left here within the first few days. What happened? So you can ask designers and tell them, oh, maybe you should guide people by the hand, give them some more missions, you know, a way to retain them at that point, because you lose a lot of people. Or maybe the game was just not for them. Uh, another interesting point here, uh, here is the number of people who import uh, Forza 3 data. And of course, they do it very quickly. Uh, why it's interesting is because it's an outlier. And if you don't know what the achievement is about, you're like, oh, mind-blowing, an outlier, amazing. <gasps> and yeah, it's totally expected. All right, so the takeaways for this first part, uh, basically play the game so you can come up with descriptive metrics, like the number of races, and achievements that make sense and that you can understand and quickly tell the designers, hey, this is, this is stuff that's happening. Uh, segmentation, the way you can do it quick and dirty is by looking at the average, the median, and then taking the segments that show up in there. So you have three categories of players, your casual, your mid-core, and your hardcore if you want. And then progression and churn, if you want to do it quickly, uh, you can look just at the achievements, thanks to Bruce Phillips. And yes, that's all for this part. Um, any questions? Quick ones? Yeah. I mean, was there a response from the team about like that churn graph that you had? Yeah, they said it's interesting. And Is that good, interesting, bad, interesting? They didn't say much. They said, cool, you got a graph. <laughs> they talked more about the stuff I'm going to talk in the second part. Okay. Um, but yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I mean, uh, it's neat that you found a way to do it with achievement data. But isn't it easier to do with just uh, with log? You have some sort of log when players 
access the game. Like, so yeah, so you can do not, it. It's not the most obvious way that I could think of doing churn. Mm -hmm. it's, it's cool that you were able to support other data with a different set, but I'm curious why you went that route. So if you go with achievements, you can sort of port these achievements across games. So if you look at Forza 3, you probably have the same levels. Uh -huh. Forza 4, you also have the levels. Forza 5, you have the same levels. So you can compare basically Forza 3 to 4 to 5. That's one advantage. So Bruce Phillips did this with uh, FPS at the time he did it. So he had Modern Warfare, another Modern Warfare. He had a Battle Cry. He had a bunch of others. Battlefield and Far Cry. And he had them all plotted like this. So he had this graph, like say, right. this curves for each game. So you could compare, ah, one is more retention, one is you know more trend, one is that way. Okay. So that's why I also went with this graph, because they were working on Forza 5, and I told them, hey, maybe you want to add the Forza 5 graph later. Does that answer your question? Yeah, for yeah? sure. Thank okay. you. All right, I'll move on then. So this part is about answering a question that the designers may have. Uh, in my case, I hadn't met the designers when we came up with the question. In fact, I was talking with Tom, my mentor, during the internship, and I was like, oh, you know, I really like the, ga the way the, the game plays. Like, I'm, I can tweak the assist and the difficulty at will. It's very nice. And he's like, hmm, I never change the assist. I, I always play the same way. So I thought, huh, that's, I wonder how people progress, because he wasn't progressing. He wasn't increasing the difficulty. And I was changing the difficulty. So I thought, hmm, let's, let's look at this. And so Forza is basically a super cool simulation of racing. So you have all these controls you can have. They simulate tires independently. So each tire is simulated independently. You can refuel your car. You have damages on your right side. Your car is going to tilt to the right side. You have damages on the left side. It's going to tilt. It's, it's a simulation. It's fundamentally a simulation. Very, very advanced. And so you can control all this on your controller. Well, a lot of it. So first you have a digit for the gas. Then you have a digit for, say, braking. You have also another digit for steering. Digit as in finger, right? And then you'd have also gear up, gear down, clutch. And then you'd have, you know, oh, I want to see which hammer is coming behind me to run my back. Oh, OK. Another one, right? So you have a lot of things you can control with your fingers. But not everybody can handle that. So when the game starts, uh, they disable most of these buttons. So you're driving in automatic. You're not driving with clutch or with you know, gear up and down. Uh, you don't have the handbrake. The car auto brakes for you. Um, they do a bunch of things like this to, to make it more palatable as a beginner. So one such assist, as it's called, which is just an assist is just a, a tool the game gives you to make your driving experience easier. So auto brake, basically, when you're approaching a curve, when it's red, the car is going to brake for you. Imagine you're playing Mario Kart, you accelerate, and then suddenly you go into a turn and you're about to ram somebody and kick them out. And really the car breaks for you and you're still pressing accelerate, but it, it stops. So that's the red part. Yellow, you accelerate, it does nothing, but it's not going to break for you. And green, you accelerate, it finally does something. Okay, so you could just play the game pressing accelerate like this, and you just have to steer. You have nothing else to do, right? So that's one way to, to make the game easier. Um, Another way to make the game easier for people is stability or traction, also are two similar assists. So stability, when you turn your car, it's not going to skid and go outside. Basically, you're still always in control of your tires. It's like ABS, but when you're turning, instead of, instead of just when you're braking. Um, and the trajectory line is basically a, an overlay on top of the track that tells you which trajectory, when you're taking a curve or in a straight line, is optimal. So when the line is green, you can accelerate. When it's red, you should break. It's just hints. It's not forcing you to break. It's just telling you, if you go that way, you should probably break. OK? All right. So what the game does, because there's all these assists, and there's roughly 12 assists you can use, disabling an assist gives you extra credits. So if you finish a race with fewer assists enabled, you get more money. So more risk, more reward, right? Uh, the game ships with bundles. So you have the easy bundle up to the expert bundle. And I was expecting, well, I'm guessing that people start in easy. And as they progress, they're going to follow up to expert. right? So the line assist that we saw just before, this, uh, basically is completely full. So the green and the red parts in easy and medium. It's only the break, so only the red part when you're uh, in hard and advanced. And there's no line at all when you're in expert. Okay, and for all the other assists, 
That's what it looks like. So you have this complex kind of matrix of assist that's embedded in the game that's kind of assuming that, oh, hopefully I'll never have to have my traction off and my stability on, right? You'd expect that when my traction is gonna be on, I'm always gonna have this stability on. But it may be that sometimes player may need to change it one by one, right? And they do. But we wanted, we wanted to check whether this is actually adequate. Or should we probably do, okay, maybe the line should actually be full up to here, or maybe full up to here. Can we basically adjust these, these assists? Make sense? Okay, so that's very deep and very like narrow. But we thought, hey, nobody has looked at this before, and Tom had worked on a skill in Halo and recovery after you take a break. So we thought, hey, well, let's look at skill in Forza and focus on the bundles. And that also prompted issues of like, what's the default experience for whom? But I'll talk about this later. So the question was, do bundles support uh, skill progression well? And what we did, we came up with a bunch of graphs, lots and lots of graphs, and that's one of them. Uh, so what this graph shows, uh, that's the number of races that players have played, okay? And that's the ratio of players who reach that number of races. So you have, that's the gray curve here for the number of players. 10 races, you have 70% of people who reach 10 races. You have roughly 20% of players who reach 100 races, and you have 0% who reach 1,000 races. Okay, that's the gray line. And then we look at how much the assists are turned on or off. So first race, 62, 63% of people use the auto break feature, but it quickly drops. And by race, say 100, only 20% still use the auto break. And then if you compare that to the clutch, uh, the clutch is basically activated. So nobody, basically only 10% of people at most, uh, basically actually use the clutch. So we wondered, oh, maybe it's because there's actually people driving their car in their, well, their virtual car, in their dining room with actually the pedals and the wheel, rather than just the controller, right? Because playing the controller with like eight digits at once is kind of tricky. Um, yes. And brake line, the assist here, was still enabled by, say, 70% of people. This line here, the pink line, uh, which we found was a lot because we thought, wait, why do people still need the braking line? Like this, this doesn't make sense. Like, and we thought, well, actually, Forza gives you many, 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 many tracks and many variations on these tracks. So you have, say, uh, Laguna Seca has 10 different variations. And that's one track with 10 different ways of racing this track. You can race it forward, you can race it reverse, you can race it mirror. There's so many ways you can race, right? And so people kind of don't really know where the track is. They don't always know where the track is going. So is this a left turn? Is a right turn coming? Maybe I should break now, maybe I shouldn't. And if they don't really know the track, they're gonna end up going outside of the track. So that's why we thought they put the brake line. Uh, yes. And so we looked also at online mode. So this was in single player mode when you play by yourself. And the dip here is because people finish single player mode. They complete the 10 cups of single player mode and then they're like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm gonna stop using the assist and I'm gonna go back to the previous cups, the previous easier races and disable some assist more. So they got more, they got harder on themselves, but they probably used easier cars to drive. Um, or different circuits that they knew. Yeah? So, so these are all self-initiated settings changes? Okay. Nothing was pushed to the users. But they were self-motivated by getting more money by disabling the assist. You get 10% extra credits when you disable one assist. So the clutch, yeah, that's something important actually. Good question. Um, you get 10% for disabling the clutch, but you also get 10% by disabling the auto brake. So it's the same incentives. And it kind of made us wonder, oh, maybe we should tell the designers Give the clutch, say, a 50% increase in credits, but give auto brake a 5% increase in credits. So you lower this curve down because people have more incentive to disable it. And you maybe keep this higher or maybe even lower because people are like, ah, it's only 5%, whatever, right? Um, but then we thought again and we thought, maybe actually using the clutch is not fun. So people would play without the clutch, get the 50% extra credit, but would lose. So they would never get the credits anyway. So like, ah. Oh, what do we tell them now? 
So yeah, we didn't tell them anything and we just showed the graph and they figured it out. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's because it's logarithmic. Oh, okay. So basically, the number of data points here, there's 500 of them, and here there's 500 of them. Okay. Uh, it actually goes on. There's people who waste like 5,000 times. This is, yeah, <laughs> this is crazy. Any other questions? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. This probably, and I apologize for being here late, but how much, if any, of this was looked at in lab with players just to see, like, oh, sorry. Can you throw it yeah. So I, it's I big data stuff. stuff. But did any of this get plugged in with the team that was doing the lab work? So it wasn't really lab work. Uh, we didn't have players come in and play for us. Uh, we had the raw data that when the game launched, so telemetry, 200,000 people, uh, which was 5% of the whole player base. Mm -hmm. And that's just analytics kind of work. Okay. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move on. So that was in single player. And this is in multiplayer. And so, just so you know, you see the difference again. So, the big thing that we were surprised at, but then we we're like, oh, actually, that makes sense. Uh, the damage assist. So when you play with other people, other real people, uh, most people basically say, I don't want to be, I don't want to, my car to suffer damages from other players. Which makes sense. I, we were like, hmm, why is that? I played online. And I played my, you know, Ferrari, and the guy next to me had a Lamborghini, and I'm like, ah, let's race. And, and then this guy behind us has a Hummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that didn't end well. Um, so that's why people basically enable the damage assist all the time. When they race online, it's just always on. So when we went to the developer, to the designers, we said, hmm, maybe you guys should just enable the damage by default. I said, no, 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 we don't want to do that because actually we let people pick the assist that they want in their game. So when you're hosting, you can force assists on people. And so people would force the damage on everybody else. So even if I wanted to play with the damage assist off, they would force it on me and I'd still have to play with the assist on. So if you're the host and you're playing a hammer, you want to disable the assist, basically. And then you troll people and everybody's mad. Um, <laughs> what else is there? Oh, yeah. Uh, that also prompted us to tell them, why do you need three assists, like three values for this assist? So you had, remember, for the damage, you had cosmetic and limited and simulation. Cosmetic is just appearance, like the first slide I had. It just looks ugly, but it's still working perfectly. Limited means it's gonna sort of steer a bit and sort of be a bit clunky, but it's not that bad, you can still race. And simulation is basically like real life simulation. So you have to refuel your car, if you are hit in the tire, your tire is blown up and you have to change your tire, uh, make a pit stop. It's, it's really crazy. And so there's, it's a ternary assist, right? Cosmetic, limited, and simulation. But here you see that there's really only two values. Most people use it on and 5% use it off. And there's nothing in between, right? There's no need for the limited assist. Uh, the clutch. The clutch is, again, the assist that fewer people uh, use beyond damage. Auto brake is disabled by most people, the very bottom line. Uh, and the brake line is still here. So that's the line we can't see very well here in pink. Uh, but you still have half of your player base, even by race 1000, right? Half of your player base always uses uh, the brake line. I thought that's tricky because it's still, you know, people by now should know the tracks and they must play the tracks always the same ones, all again and again. They still use the braking line just to get a cue of when they should break and when other people are going to break and which trajectory is optimal. So yeah, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, so in the end, what happened in Forza 5 was that instead of having the line, for instance, the line assist being full, then only the break, then none, they pushed the none outside of the expert bundle. Okay, so that's what the arrow means. They expanded the breaking line to cover all the hardest assists, hardest bundles. And they kicked out the no line, please, uh, in its own submenu, all right? Based on, on these graphs. And then they did this also for the other assists. So they shifted most things to the right. Uh, they added another kind of assist, so that's why easy and medium don't seem very different here. So they added another one here, which is steering. Um, for the damage, 
they kept it binary, so you just have cosmetic and simulation. You don't have limited anymore. Uh, the clutch, which nobody uses, kicked out, and they made automatic with clutch, uh, without clutch, basically bigger, which makes sense because in the US, everybody drives automatic, nearly. Most people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, braking, they basically kept the ABS most of the time. Uh, this was super useful uh, when we talked with the designers. They're saying, yeah, I mean, you are having a muscle car or some car like this, you want ABS, you want traction, and you want stability. Like that's three S's they use to choice well. Even when you have, you know, just a Mustang or some entry level muscle car, they're like, yeah, yeah we still we still need this. So that's why they, they still pushed, you know, stability, traction, and braking farther. So that shipped uh, in Forza 5, and we were pretty happy. Uh, they didn't tell us when we visited them, like, oh, that's interesting. And then shipped, and then I had to play Forza 5 to be like, yeah, <laughs> useful. So yeah, for this part, uh, the takeaways were uh, simpler is better. So for the damage type, we had ternary. Really make it binary. You don't need that much complexity. Uh, check between modes. So single player, we saw some patterns with the damage type and the brake line and the auto brake. Really, it's not the same thing at all in multiplayer. And probably if you have versus or time race or some kind of other modes like this, things might be different. So you should double check. Uh, nobody uses the clutches, and I, the clutch, not the clutches. Um, so probably you should push these expert options, like the clutch, uh, in their own submenu because you know very very few people are actually gonna need to use them. And then this is what the paper we wrote was about, because at Microsoft Research you have to write papers. Um, it's what's actually the default experience. So by race one, compared to race ten, compared to race one hundred, you have completely different players. Um, you have you know, more casual players, you have more hardcore players. And so this prompted us to, to ask if can we nudge players to disable an assist. So say when I reached race 10, and so far I was always finishing first, but I was using all the assists, all enabled. Maybe I could, like I could make a recommender system that tells me, oh, you know, you're ready to disable auto break. Like, try it, and you'll get 10% extra. And you know, you should do it, try it and then see if people stay with the assist off or if they re-enable it because they really sucked and finished second. Ah. <laughs> That's it, so I'll take any other question if you have any, and thank you. Mm -hmm. so, you oh. Oh, sorry. Ah. so, you know, are you using clutch, using brakes, using, <laughs> and having assistance, these are all things that are, they're not, uh, they're not in isolation, right? They all impact each other. So the logical question then is how do these settings changes cluster when they change some things? How do they cluster together in sets mm -hmm. to, to adjust overall handling? So we, we had a graph for that also, but I didn't have time to put it in. So what we looked at was the, we did a, basically an approach that was looking at the sets. So you had the easy bundle, and then you had a bunch of different ways to make a bundle which is the set you're talking about. So you have the easy one with, say, auto break disabled. Um, so for instance, you have easy without auto break. A lot of people were doing that, and that was completely good. Then you have stability, traction, and line with break, and that was another very big one. And so, we wanted to give only one message to the designers, which was, OK, maybe you should either tweak this table or completely rethink the bundle thing. Because people really need you know, one slice of it that may actually look like this, and sometimes actually look like this. Yeah, yeah. In, I mean, in, in multi-space, I'm thinking that it's, it's, a, it's a cluster, mm -hmm. right? that, which would be a much better reflection of handling rather than a feature-based. So when I talked with them, we kind of talked very quickly about it because they were busy and all. But if you have, say, a rear-wheel drive car, this was very, very strongly correlated with stability and traction right. because your car is going to skid when you start accelerating, so people would turn it on. But then if you have an all-wheel drive car, then you, don't, you won't need them. But then the car will rate it the same way. So what can you do, right? Any other question, or are we out of time? Yeah. All right, well, thanks again. Thank you.